all right so we'll now begin with the next topic in section c that is violence against women and uh, before we begin, begin with a rough overview of the topic let's have a look at some of the previous year questions on the subject all right so as you may see there have been questions on domestic violence act and evaluation of that the possible causes of the spurt of increased violence against women in public spaces problem of trafficking reasons for the escalation of violence against women in the public domain and interesting thing is you can see how the 2017 question is a repetition of the 2014 question outright repetition then in 2019 there was a question on the posh act and uh, the workplace dynamics and sexual harassment of women uh, the important thing that uh, I felt after seeing all these previous year questions was how all these questions have been related to the contemporary developments. They were, they targeted something that is uh, that was in the news and required an understanding of the current affairs along with an applied knowledge of some basics and some um, theoretical uh, notions on the subject. So let's begin with the topic. All right. So when we are talking about a subject like violence of women, uh, let us uh, first with the begin with the definition. So again, in 1993, in the World Human Rights Conference at Vienna, gender violence was recognized as a human rights violation for the first time. And the United Nations it defines violence against women as any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual or mental harm or suffering to women, including threats um, of such acts, coercion, arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether in private or in public life. So as you may see, I have got this definition from the UN website and uh, Whenever looking for definitions like this is something that I would suggest to you guys. Maybe just look at um, some of these websites, UN websites or government websites and they might have um, already released conference proceedings or certain reports on a certain topic. So you can always look for definitions from such places. Then uh, there is a definition by Schuller, and Schuller defines gender violence as an act that involves force or coercion such as to perpetuate and promote hierarchical gender relations so once we have covered the definition of violence we'll now move on to the forms of violence now nitin sangwan it uh, divides violence against women into two forms manifest and latent manifest violence can be rape dowry death feticide domestic violence and latent violence is patriarchy, unequal employment, poor nutrition, pornography. Now, um, I added to um, another pointers to like in these subtopics like manifest can also include acid attack and latent can also include something like unequal access to healthcare. Now, these are the broad guidelines and when you're working with them, you might have to substantiate them with additional data on the subject or um, <coughs> any quote that you might have found on the topic or any perspective of a thinker. So let's say when we're talking about acid attack, you can um, quote a contemporary example like the movie Chapak delved into this issue. Similarly for unequal healthcare, there is a sociologist Rajni Palriwala and they talk about how in homes there is a very unequal proportioning of food so that the more nutritious food is given to the son and the daughter is usually left with uh, the leftovers and uh, that is the reason why anemia or certain health issues are more prevalent in young women.
in patriarchy you can quote silvia wolby how um there are like how silvia wolby identifies specific structures um state family sexuality as the site of patriarchy how they perpetuate certain notions of subjugation of women and uh, consideration of women as inferior to men so this discussion on patriarchy it can even be linked to paper 1 uh, like whatever we have studied on gender and the thinkers that we might have utilized there in fact a very interesting um, pointer that i might want to add on patriarchy is the work of frederick engels so engels has a very interesting uh, theory he says when earlier humans were hunter gatherers there was a simple sexual division of labor in the hunter gatherer society and when they shifted to settled cultivation that required land all of a sudden land became this new parcel of uh, status and of determining uh, power and prestige now control over ra- land required control over succession like uh, after a certain person all right so angles makes this very important point about how land was the currency when hunter uh, gatherers turned to settled cultivation and control over land required control over progeny this meant control over women's reproductive faculties and that is how the notion of purity of line or purity of succession or pure breed like uh came into uh came into the account and that is how the sexual division of labor uh in the hunter and gathering stage turned to a division of laborers in the settled cultivation phase now margaret schuller um she also identifies uh, some other forms of violence that could be physical psychological based on resource deprivation and commodification it's basically just um a reiteration of the manifest and the latent forms of violence um but like um, you you can couple some of the things that you um, might have noted here so physical would include things like rape or dowry death or domestic violence psychological um psychological could be confinement a forced marriage uh, or any other sort of um threat of torture mental coercion resource deprivation it could be um in terms of material deprivation like uh, lack of access to um nutrition or food or a living space and it it can also be in terms of intellectual deprivation like lack of access to education or lack of education to uh, um or like lack of agency uh, to make your own choice then commodification this is where media comes into the picture trafficking prostitution like commodification would be anywhere where a human being's value is reduced to um a material value like you cannot put a price on human life but when you do that that would be commodification the next thing to cover would be um causes what leads to violence against women and there is some conference rep- uh, proceedings by rashida manju uh, in some un report so and uh, the pointers identified are historical historically unequal power relations control of sexuality the privacy doctrine conflict and government in action now when we are talking about historically unequal power relations um something that you can quote would be how uh, in ancient india the law givers such as manu uh, in their smritis they talk about how a woman um when unmarried should be under the father's control then under the brother's control her husband's control and ultimately her son's control so it's like 
a woman's life is always overshadowed um, by the presence of the male members um, who are related to her either through affinal kinship or uh, through a consanguinal kinship this can be quoted when talking about historically unequal power relations in control of sexuality you may quote veena das who talks of how a woman's body is supposed to be uh the store the store point of honor so a woman's body becomes this trope of honor and any violation of that leads to a loss of honor for the family the clan and the community so this further results in incidents like honor killing where marrying outside your caste your religion or your region is supposed to be um, a defiling of the community ties then there is privacy doctrine privacy doctrine can be used as an example like in this debate surrounding marital rape like there is uh, an argument uh, among the certain section of the population which says that if marital rape is criminalized it will affect the sanctity of uh marriage uh, and marriage is supposed to be this um sacred social contract so a marital rape would bring that private social sacred contract into the public sphere and uh, feminists tend to argue uh, they tend to argue back deconstructing this uh, privacy doctrine and it said that personal is political and that is even in the personal space you have to bring in state you have to bring in uh, some sort of um, an interrogation some sort of a questioning to counter these hierarchical and skewed power relationships then conflict conflict um, a lot of examples can be uh, quoted here it could be an ethnic conflict an international conflict a regional conflict so for example um right now the ethnic conflict that is um, happening in manipur or if you take india's example uh our history of partition so ramchandra guha writes that how during partition it was basically the women on both the sides of the border who suffered the most and uh, in india after gandhi i think there is uh, a page or page or two yeah there is there is i think an entire chapter on this you can actually like just have a look at it um it's it's a very insightful read and it can give an example into how even in international relations there is this discussion on how we need to look at diplomatic policy international diplomacy from a feminist perspective because when wars happen when any sort of uh, crisis happens it is the vulnerable sections it is the women and the children who are affected the most they are forced into prostitution or uh, uh, or they are like subjected to violence or they have to uh, or they lose their livelihoods and have to like start from scratch all over again so uh, even the russia ukraine conflict can be quoted here in this example or the afghanistan uh, conflict how it's the afghani women who have been denied the right to education and all, like all the rights all the progress that they had made in these years has been um pushed decades back because of the taliban rule then there is this another section how globalization modernization and the contemporary changes have uh, had a bearing on violence against women so economic survey 2017 2018 talked about this phenomena feminine uh, feminization of agriculture how loss of wages is forcing men in villages to migrate out in search for work in search for better wages and women are left behind to work on the fields often because of their lower bargaining power this makes them more susceptible to violence or cheating or uh, being exploited 
and that has been uh, something that has refer uh, that has been referred to as feminization of poverty how feminization of agriculture is actually leading to feminization of poverty the term feminization of poverty was coined by diana pierce then the pankar gupta he talks about how this focus on consumerism has given this new philip to dowry because it's now related to a status symbol and it is this increased intent for more consumerism or consumption that is worsening the dowry problem then karuna ahmed talks about basically pink collarization of jobs how in competitive markets women have little to no bargaining power and as a result they are stuck in low paying and low status jobs which can be termed as pink collarization so when we are talking about the way ahead i have like divided it into some of the initiatives and uh, um you know the constitutional and the legislative framework you can quote the existing constitutional frameworks article 15 clause 3 23 clause 1 51a fundamental duties it is here that a uh, government can take uh, any affirmative act for vulnerable sections like women this deals with the prohibition of prostitution and uh, um yeah uh, pro- uh, prostitution and trafficking in women and children in fundamental duties there is a specific fundamental duty that talks about re- renouncing practices that are derogatory to women then then for legislations i came across this interesting uh, government site uh, yeah pib pib has this page um and uh, this particular uh, article on safety and security of wom- uh, women and girls it covers the entire legislative aspect bri- brilliantly they they've talked about the domestic violence act the dowry prohibition act uh, protection of uh, uh, protection from sexual offenses the posh act 2013 criminal law amendments setting up the nirbhaya fund uh, investigation tracking system for sexual offenses in uh, states and uh, also by ministry of home affairs a database on sexual offenders emergency response support system safe city projects smart policing and safety management in certain cities guidelines for collection of forensic evidence then there is women safety division by uh, ministry of uh, home affairs and one stop centers by ministry of women and child development publicity campaigns and uh, advisories to all the state governments for increasing gender sensitivity i think this is like a very uh, uh, brilliant compilation when it comes to like the legislative and the administrative aspect of security and it can be like quoted as such then he for she it's like a campaign uh, by un being uh, and the ambassador is emma watson uh and i think this campaign is more about sort of initiating a global dialogue on women on equality and how feminism is about equality for both the sexes and not about bashing uh, bashing the one and uh, sort of using it to uplifting the other so it's a discourse on equality then in india there has been men against violence and abuse a collective and uh, maba is basically um a sort of an organization or sort a sort of a project that is spearheaded and run by men against the um, violence that is perpetuated uh, against women then there is bell bajao bell bajao is an initiative and uh, the overall uh, thought is very simple and uh, very effective a civil society initiative it is that if you think uh that a woman is uh is being subjected to domestic violence all that you have to do is ring the doorbell that will interrupt the perpetrator and it will make him realize that the uh, woman is not alone and uh, uh, she has support besharmi morcha 
or slut walk it has been an initiative of women uh, again a civil society collective and the focus has been on marching in the streets um wearing any or every sort of cloth and trying to portray through this a uh, slut walk the message that whatever a woman wears is her business and uh, the narratives like oh she was inviting it or it was because somebody was wearing skimpy clothes they were they invited um that sort of a lecherous or perversion um uh, or even an assault so the clothes that somebody is wearing has nothing to do um with her assault an assault is a criminal act and the responsibility lies with the perpetrator not the survivor blank noise is uh, an art movement against eve teasing so they use public places to uh, put up their art and to conduct uh, workshops and uh, uh, informal meetings uh, to to make public spaces more safer for women through art gulabi gang uh, you all might know it was in news in the 2000s i think mid 2000s and it's run by a woman named sampat pal and uh, she organized women from her and from nearby villages to uh, to uh, sort of like hit back against uh, the domestic violence that was prevalent in that area and also the domestic violence uh, brought on by uh, alcoholism and the after effects of alcoholism um gulabi gang and the women associated with this gang they would uh, a uh, raid uh, the alcohol dens uh, to uh, fight against alcoholism and then uh, some of the thinkers that can be quoted here include andre bete so andre bete mentions how there is always this gap between what law is and what family and culture do so law always is futuristic it talks about things as they ought to be the society as it ought, as it should be and an example would be like the posh act um how noble the intent is when it's talking about creation of uh, internal complaints committee or creating a safe workplace for women but it's the family or the culture that decides the way society is or what the dominant pattern of society is so this is why there is always this gap between legislation and the things as they are then uh, there is patricia oberoi and uh, she talks about how family is a site of violence so the patriarchal values that govern the family need to be challenged to counter violence against women then i found this author malvika karlekar she talks about how in recent years the good thing is that the narrative that is gaining a lot of importance or is gaining a lot of uh, uh, significance is that of agency and resistance so the good thing is that even uh, when the situation is not great we have not achieved an equal and just society at least we are moving away from valorization of victimhood in fact if you might have noticed in a lot of reportage it is written survivor instead of victim and the basic intent of uh, using such words or using such terminology is victim the word tends to indulge in a game of shaming somebody for a crime they did not commit our focus should be on blaming the perpetrator it's the perpetrator who is who is at fault so we are moving from a language from a narrative of victimhood to being a survivor and this agency and resistance is reflective in how uh, women today seek police help um or even seek the legislative route or the judicial route to seek help there are women collectives you you can even quote me to movement and uh, how more than ever there is like this ngo ngoization so uh, it's not just a lone woman fighting but 
scores of women st- standing up for um, each other okay i think i missed this point on government inaction maybe when we were talking about the causes for violence against women so like a government inaction an example that you can quote here would be something like custodial rape so if you remember like the previous lecture of women movements talked about how during the 70s and the 80s there was this uh, focus on um hitting back against violence and talking about rights based approach and that was brought on by this mathura uh, mathura was uh, the name of the survivor this mathura rape case that happened in uh, delhi if i'm not wrong and uh, it was a case of custodial rape that led to changes in legislations and also certain rules such as uh, le- uh, that a woman constable needs to be there when arresting a woman and things like that so this is basically a rough overview of this entire topic um while i have covered the very broad and the basic over uh, like the basic pointers on this topic you will need to substantiate with uh, data like you can quote ncrb data how ncrb data talks uh, talks about an increase in approx i think it's 80% there has been an 80% increase in violence against women between 2011 to 2021 so this is the sort of data that you will need to supplement it with you can also use perspectives like um, here i was talking about uh, frederick engels how the change from hunter gatherer society to shifting cultivation land like how this is a very marxian perspective it focuses on material base and the material base is the land you can uh, bring in interactionist approach how a uh, interactionist approach would be how power is power and resistance and hierarchy is built in everyday conversations and uh, here i'll be like straying a bit from the topic so a few days ago sir was talking about how you need to have a certain mindset a certain uh personality and knowledge is not all that matters so in sociology what we are doing these subjects these topics they are very contemporary you cannot um just rely on some rote learning and some random perspectives think deeply about the things that are happening around you so when i mention interactionist perspective look at the conversations in your family how the gender dynamic works like um your mother talking to your father might um use the term up which is a more respectful way of addressing somebody who is your senior but the husband might always use the word tum which is more informal and addressed to a junior um it's not just the age difference but also uh, the power play of who holds the uh, most decision making power within a household so sociology is something about an optic of course like learning about certain things getting an idea is okay but if you if you have to learn how to apply it just be more observant and uh, there have been very uh, interesting uh, pieces in the news recently so i was reading about how in maharashtra's satara in satara district there is a village where um, young girls uh, when born are often named nakoshi nakoshi means unwanted in marathi so the state uh, or like the state civil um, state along um, along with these civil society initiatives had a collaborative campaign the dm and everybody else was involved wherein they had a renaming ceremony so these girls were given some other name instead of nakoshi however that campaign was not successful because just changing a name isn't going to work you need to have uh, the basic frameworks the foundational institutional structures in place don't just change the name give them opportunities the education the nutrition the access to health 
that is needed to have a good life and it can be like here when we're talking about resource deprivation when there is a very basic foundational resource deprivation just a gloss over wouldn't work so yeah a lot of straying away from the topic but just to give you an idea of how to go about things sociologically and i hope this helps